So our uh, second talk this morning is Johan de Jong, and he will talk about infinite rank twisted sheets. Okay, thanks for inviting me uh, to speak. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so um, all right. So I want to talk about uh, a question that I really like, but that I don't know how to solve. And it's this question of when does a variety <clears throat> have a resolution property? Okay, and. Um, <clears throat> So, um, and in some sense, the, the way I think about this paper that has now been accepted for publication at Catholic Journal um, is that it's a negative result. It proves that you, there's something that you can't do, okay? So um, it's rare to publish negative things, right? But uh, on the way to proving this negative result, which I will explain, uh, we also prove some actual results, right? So let's <clears throat> let me remind you of um, the resolution property. <clears throat> okay. So um, so X is going to be a uh, scheme or an algebraic space, if you want. Um, and I'm going to make it of finite type. Um, <clears throat> over a field. Uh, but uh, this actually doesn't, you could take an Ethereum algebraic space. Uh, okay. And then, um, so uh, the definition is that X has the resolution property um, if and only if every coherent is the quotient of the line of the Definition thing. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, okay. And now I was going to make a, uh, tell you a few known things. And they're new to many people. Okay. And I love this paper by Totaro about this uh, material. <laughs> And then his work of Gross. It's also worked by Thomason. Okay. And then you have to, to get this all to work out, you have to do plus epsilon. And you can, <clears throat> if you don't, I have a blog, and the last blog post is the epsilon. Okay, so you could look there. And so, so here are some known things. So, um, Okay, so X has resolution property. Can you read this? Um, well, this implies that the diagonal is X to the product, and this product will be over the ground field, right? So this, this unadorned product is the product of the ground field, okay, is FI. And I think some people call this X is semi-separated, I think. Okay, but I'll just say it this way. And then this is equivalent with X as a Juan Roux. Juan Roux device. And this is, what is a Juan Roux device? This means that um, there exists and add from y to x. 
uh, where with y affine. So it's an affine scheme, okay, um, which is a torsor. Um, <clears throat> for a vector bundle on X. Okay. Yeah, so it's a morphism which locally looks like AFX to X, right? And that the transition functions are lin um, affine linear, right? And then this is if and only if um, <clears throat> X is W mod G of N. Okay, where, yeah, so sorry, you know, where um, W is quasi affine. And, um, and the action is free. <coughs> if you have a free action of this beautiful linear algebraic group on, some, uh, on a variety, then the quotient is always in the algebraic space, right? <coughs> Um, if it's a free action, right? Okay. Quasi uh, affine means open enough fine. Yeah, quasi affine means open enough. And, and quasi compact. And quasi compact. Yeah. And then maybe a good thing to know is that if X is quasi projective, or more generally, Has an ample family of invertible modules. Okay, that's some kind of slight generalization of having an ample invertible module, right? Then you have, um, then you get a general loop. Okay, and that's the, uh, that's, that's this. Stuff. Okay, so, um, so, so the last, I'm sorry, the last one is uh, Thomas. Yeah, this, this, this one, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, and now the thing is, we don't know, we don't know any X like that. So an algebraic space or scheme, which is a affine diagonal, which does not have the resolution problem. Okay, we have no example. Right? Okay, so that's what I, I find this just a sort of really nice open question, right? Aha. Yeah, so open question. Um, find X with I find X all which does not have the resolution problem. Yeah, which, <clears throat> and I, I say it this way because I suspect there are such X's. And what I should say is that if X is an algebraic stack, then there are examples, okay? And if X, and if X is not a fine diagonal, then it of course does not have the resolution property. And that's a famous example where, um, yeah, anyway. So, um, Okay. Okay. And I'll have a favorite way to make an example, but I can't prove it is an example. Okay. So, um, so example, um, take a, take a, a Z and Two closed immersions, okay, C is a finite type of 
Yes, projective over our ground field, I and J, close inversions into Pn. This will be over the ground field, okay? Uh, I of Z. Right, and then and you form the push up. Okay, so we're going to do Z, this is junior Z. This is, we're going to use I and J to PN. That's a close embedding because they're disjoint, right? Look at the map, which is the identity on each component to Z, and do the push up, right? And there's a nice paper by Farron that this is the scheme. Okay, <clears throat> you can do this in the category of schemes and so on. Okay, and um, <clears throat> my favorite example is actually to take this to be P1 and this is an embedding of degree one, so a line, an embedding of degree two, so a conic, and glue the conic to the line. And then you can easily see that this is a proper but not protective scheme because the line on the O of one from Pn won't descend, right? Because the O of one will pull back to one line all by the line embedding and the three two line all by the conic embedding, right? Okay. So it's very easy to make proper but not projective schemes over a field, right? In, in this manner. Okay. And the question is, right, that I wanted to answer is this a kind of example? In, in EG, the line conic case, right? Is it finite type? What? Is it finite type? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's one of the X's from before. And it's a scheme, not an algebraic space. Yeah. And I don't know the answer to this, even in the line conic case, but I, I worked a little bit with a postdoc uh, at Columbia, Simon Felton. And it, this we did the case where you take P3 line and conic glue them. And there, there are lots of vector bundles that you can make, but we couldn't make enough of them. But so I'm, I really don't know. I really don't want to guess. Okay. Great. Okay. Now let's go to twisted sheaves. What does this have to do with twisted sheaves? So I think the problem is we need some kind of invariant that will tell us you can't do this, right? And, I, and so in this paper <clears throat> with my co-authors, right? Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about joint work. Thanks, Lizzie. And Mencio. Shen. And in this joint work, we come up with uh, an obstruction, okay? A potential obstruction. Okay, let's see. And yeah. Is that easy to see the uh, affine uh, embedding property? Yeah, it, this X is proper, so it has its ah, okay. diagnosis. Is, yes, no, good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so twisted sheaves. So we're going to pick an alpha in H2 et al. XGM. Okay, this is not the prior group, right? Okay. There are two reasons why it's not the prior group. If you're in the brown group, you're torsion, and this doesn't have to be torsion. Okay. And another reason is that we don't know that the torsion elements of this will give you the prior group in general, right? For a projective or cross projective, we do by a theorem of God. Okay. <clears throat> but this is very obviously very closely related to the bar group. And I think you should, but you should think during this talk for alphas which have infinite order. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, well, and what in this, in this example, right? In this example, it will turn out that the Brown group of C will be. Essentially, um, sorry, the prior group of X, sorry, H to HL XGN will be um, basically the PCAR group of C. I'll tell you, I'll tell you later. <clears throat> okay, 
So twist the cheeks. Um, oh, this. Oh no. So um, definition. A. I'm not going to write this quasi coherent. Um, alpha twisted. F, okay, is okay. There are two ways to say this. So if you're a stacks person, if you're a stacks person, then you let x do x uh, is a GM jerk. Corresponding, which corresponds to alpha, right? Can you read this? Now it's getting maybe a little harder. Okay, and then um, <clears throat> then then f is a quasi-gradient module x, right? Is QC on x script x? Sorry. Okay, and such that inertia such that inertia, which is GM, right? Inertia of a GM curve is GM, right? X by the standard calculation. X by standard. So I think most psyche people will already know this. So, um, yeah. I don't know if I can. But there's a completely elementary way to think about these. So, um, <clears throat> so others, oh, you, you're allowed to think in, in both ways, right? Take a tall covering. Um, and as such that alpha corresponds to a two co cycle A, I, J, K, right? In O star. Yeah. Okay, you should now complain because you now have to say, Johan, why can you represent by a two co cycle? And this is a funny story. I was a, I visited here as a grad student. Um, and at exactly, and, and uh, Pottings gave a course on crystalline cohomology, and um, he had to define, he had to construct a cup product, I think it was, and he had some, that was like maybe one of the very few times he had trouble and he had to look at his paper or something, which he had in his press pocket, <laughs> and he said, um, if I get stuck, uh, I can always kill you all by using hypercoppers. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, you can do this with hypercoppers, okay. Yeah, but you can almost always compute, uh, by a theorem of Artin, you can almost always use check coverings to compute a thousand much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then you have this two co cycle, right? And then then what is a twisted sheet, right? It's a system where you have FIs and phi IJs. And right, this is kind of like the same data. So FI should be quasi coherent, right? The Q curl of, of UI. And then um, phi IJ should be an isomorphism. And then this, I love this. Okay. Then you say, well, you, you say, well, they shouldn't satisfy the, the go cycle condition, but they should satisfy up to the go cycle, right? This is, so the go cycle condition is uh, phi jk post composed phi ij should be aijk times phi ij. And this should be, of course, on the UI cross X, UJ cross X, UK, right? You have to restrict everywhere, right? 
Yeah. And then you get a category, it's an abelian category, and so on, and it works exactly like cross coordinate modules. Okay, there's no there's no mystery. And then since your thing is locally free, if the FIs are locally free, right? And it's finite, it's coherent if the FIs are coherent, right? So all the usual notions for quasi coherent modules that you know and love, they will now make sense for this test, right? Okay, great. And for example, right, a classical result, which is, right, is that, that of alpha is in the image of the canonical map. So the barrel group of X is defined using Morija Kozman's classes of bar of class of my algebras, right? Um, and this injects by the, taking the class of an my algebra, right? And when are you in the image? If and only if. Is this a finite locally free? F twisted alpha twisted chief. And of course, that's that positive rank. Of positive rank. And of course, I should say that the rank is a function and it should be everywhere positive, right? <clears throat> is that okay? You could also have constant positive rank that's also a curve. Okay, it's easy, to, it's very easy to see. Okay, great. So, yeah. So now maybe you see where this is going, right? Instead of like looking for alphas which have a finite locally free alpha twisted sheet of positive rank, you can look at ones which have a locally free one of positive rank, right? Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so. Make it, let's make a definition. What, what does finite mean here? That means a rank is finite, so it's locally free. So locally you have some integer so that it's O to the power of that integer. You want that integer to be finite. Okay. <clears throat> okay, definition. This LF stands for locally free. Okay, is um, uh, it, is it's those alpha, uh, right? Such that it's just uh, alpha twisted locally free. F of countable rank. I'm just going to say countable rank, where I mean by countable, I don't mean finite. Yeah? <laughs> I, I mean countable and not finite. <laughs> okay. yeah. Everywhere countable. How do you say that? Countable. Countably of constant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Although there is only one cardinal, cardinal, so that's probably okay. Is it okay? Is it clear what I mean? It means that you can. It means that the FIs are locally in some topology, and let's say they dot topology, are actually free modules of. But of countable rank, yes. Okay. <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily mean the FIs themselves, right, are free, right? Okay, they're only locally free. Yeah? Wait, so if you have a finite locally free one, then you also have a countably locally free one. Yes. So why avoid the finite one? So I didn't follow what you were saying, why you wanted it. Oh, that's because it will be easier later. Yeah, okay, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, ah, so Barkov showed, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, no, 
Now, warning. Okay, you can tensor two countable locally free modules and get another countable locally free module. That's fine. So it's a it's a monoid, but you can't take the dual of a locally free module, right? It's not even quasi coherent in general, right? So so this is only a sub monoid. Okay, as far as I know, as far as we know. <laughs> Do you have examples where it's not the subgroup? No, we don't have examples. That's really, uh, really unfortunate. Are you correct? Yeah, I was asking. Okay, yeah. No, we don't have examples. Um, and for the X's that I care about, the X's with I find that. Is yeah. that why your exclamation point looks like half like a question mark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, yes, right. <laughs> yes, it's a question. It's a question. In the paper, it's a question. Yes. Great, thank you. And so now the theorem that I'm going to explain to you, and it's not super hard, is that okay? Yeah. So the theorem that if X has the resolution property, then LF Brewer X is the whole thing. Yep. And this is why I don't have interesting examples where this doesn't work. <laughs> oh, sorry. So I, I wanted to say for those who haven't thought about this, if you take the sheep arm of plus n in n OX, OX into OX, right? And that's the product sheet, right? And then I think that's so, right? And, and uh, now you should think about why this isn't a cross cricket module if you haven't seen that before. Okay. Yeah. But you must have seen this because you were like taught that. The push forward of a quasi-coherent module by a quasi-separated and quasi-compact morphism is quasi-coherent, right? And when you do that, this is sort of a way to see that, like, okay, it doesn't work if the morphism isn't quasi-compact. There's infinitely many copies of X mapping down to X, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. So let's go back to the theorem. Okay. Okay, yeah, right? Yeah, so okay, yeah, and I want I wanted to use this when we start thinking about the paper, right? I wanted to use this to get a counterexample to the resolution property by finding an alpha and so on and so on. Okay. Okay, so sketch of the proof. Okay, um <clears throat> so it's, it's not going to be very long. Okay, so let f from y to x be a, oh, is it gone? No, it's still there. The proof in the paper does not use this existence of the journal device, okay? It just uses the Equivalence with the last thing, which is already in Tartar's and Gross's paper. Okay, so but it's it's easier to do it with with having this thing. So let me do it this way. Okay, well, um, so um, yeah. So you have your alpha on X. You can pull it back to Y. You get an F upper star alpha Y. And then alpha f upper star alpha twisted sheets on y, when you push them forward by f, they're alpha twisted sheets on x. And that's just some local calculation with like pairs like this. Yeah. It's it's actually like 100 percent clear, right? On the on the u over the ui, you're just pushing and pulling cross coherent modules, right? And then the phi i j just goes along for the right. right? Okay. So right, so pairs. And push forward. 
F uh, of the star alpha twisted to alpha twisted. But this, this Y is locally just affine space cross X but mapping to X, right? So a locally free module on Y is gonna be pulled back, pushed forward to an infinite rank locally free module on X, right? This is just three modules over the polynomial algebra. They are also free over the ground field or the ground ring, right? Okay, so, right, so, uh, okay. Now, now this is, Okay, yeah, I'm supposed to, yeah, I should do this. Okay, so F level star of infinite rank twisted right, is infinite rank twisted. Okay, yeah, I tried to explain that just now, right? So something that's locally free on Y will push forward to something that's locally free on X. Just gonna be infinite rank. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And, um, uh, and this reduces us to the next step, right? So now it suffices to find our infinite rank thing on Y, and that's F line. So we reduce this, so we reduce to the next step. So step two. Y is uh, X is F I. And here there is this fun argument that is in this paper by Gobber uh, about the um, about the Brower group, right? That if you have any atom cover of an affine, you can dominate it by a Zariski covering of a finite locally free covering. Okay. So so this and this then immediately means there exists a finite Locally free. So this is a sort of Gobber's trick. Um, um, subjective. Okay. F from x prime to x. Subject. Subjective. Finally, locally free. F from x prime to x such that F of the star alpha is risky locally. Trivial. So let me let me go over it again, right? So I have my state all cover, and what the cover trick says is you can find the cover trick says that you can find x prime to x and an open covering where you can factor the most of the W I to X through this UI. So if you pull back the alpha. W i, you're pulling it like this, but on this cover, then of course alpha is trivial, right? That's how uh, Jack homology works. Okay. What does that mean locally free f? Huh? There exists a subjective finite locally free f. Yeah, it just means it's finite and the push forward of the structure C is for it's it's locally free. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for asking. Okay. <clears throat> um, great. So, uh, okay, so then again, we can reduce to X prime. So we may assume our class is Zariski locally trivial. And actually, it's very possible that you can actually just find, uh, okay, 
You can do that. If, okay, now let me not even say this. Okay. Okay, great. Um, XFI help us risk it out trivial. And here there's another like standard argument that I think is due to cover, where this immediately reduces you to the case where um, you have two affine opens, you know the results that you want to prove is true for each of them, and you have to show it for the union. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So by a standard argument. Um, and I think this, I can tell you what it's reduced to. Like, think about the induction principle, for example. Um, X is U union V, um, U V and U intersect V are all affine. On U, you have a alpha twisted. Finite rank F. So countable infinite rank F. Right? Yep. Uh, on V, you have a opposite infinite rank G. And so what we want to do, right, is we want to glue F to G. Okay? And we have to do it over the intersection, right? And so what should be what should be now going on is that we, we so we want to prove, right? We want to glue these twisted sheaves. So we want to show that these two sheaves are isomorphic. And now this is where like you do a little bit of commutative algebra, right? Gas's theorem says that if you have an infinite rank, if you have a big projective module, it's free, right? So in some sense, these are twisted, but in some sense, they should both be free and they have the same rank, so they should be isomorphic. And so I don't know how to prove that, but I know how to prove it when you put a direct sum n over this. So the lemma is that, that you have to prove, and the arguments are very similar. It uses like um, Eilenberg swindle, right? Um, you have to prove that f is to u intersect v and copies is isomorphic to g restricted to u intersect v. Okay. And then you just glue this to this, right? And they're still infinite, countable infinite rank uh, modules. So maybe this is a very rough sketch, right? But somehow, um, and the idea is just that um, so many, it's much easier to make infinite rank vectorable than finite rank vectorable. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so great. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back to uh, my favorite example. I could say more, more about this, uh, you could ask later. Okay, so back to the example. Okay, so we're making this uh, push up, right? And um, okay, this morphs them down here, right? This is just a normalization morphs so them. You, right? So then you have um, for the start, 
going to the lower star of the end star. And then you can take the difference, right, of the two maps into OZ star, right? And so you'll get here um, I, Yeah, so um, in this case, right, we're going to get, so H2 of this will be H2 of the, the units of uh, Bn. True. <laughs> okay, yes, okay. So mu is finite? Huh? Mu is finite? Yeah, mu is, is the normalization map. I'm going to gloss over something slightly. Oh, no, for any finite map and for any sheet, it's okay. It doesn't have to be Toshi for any top on the logic. It's fine. Yes. So the, the H2 of this is just the H2 of OPN star, right? And that's zero because of our H2, if you have a smooth scheme, then every element in and this is automatic distortion, and, and uh, if it's projective, it's like this is a projection in the bar group of the ends. So, so it's best. Oh, so, so we need to, okay, sorry. Assume K is K bar. For example, C if you like. Okay. So the bar group of the end is zero. So you have from you on the higher homology of uh, it's just an isomorphism. The homology of this is just a homology of OPN star, yeah. So for a tau, a tau homology, so you're claiming that the higher are uh, in new lower star, all oh, so star zero in one yeah, side for any, yes, <laughs> our new lower star is zero, yeah, so that's one person, huh. Is that clear? I mean, it's not. No, no it's, it's because um, if you take the straight angularization at a point yes. uh, downstairs and you, 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 you pull, then you take the fire product, then it's a different union of spectral straight angularization rings, which is because if you have a finite map and this ring is strictly hands alien, then this one is a finite product of strictly hands alien rings. Yeah. Uh, For example, I mean, that's one way to prove it. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so what you get is, right, you get H2X goes to zero, and then here you get pick of Z, and here you get pick of Pn. And this is the I over star minus J over star. Okay. And so my favorite example is not a good one because in my favorite example, this is a P1, this is Z, and this is Z, and this map is multiplication by one minus multiplication by two, which is subjective. And so this is zero. But you can pick many, but pick, pick any Z which has a huge Picard group, then of course this is not subjective and you get a huge H2 GM for X, right? Okay, so I just wanted to make sure everybody agrees that this can be large. Like, for example, if you take a nodal curve for Z, right, then you uh, and you embed it with two different degrees, differing by one, then you will get that this is equal to C star or K star. Yeah? Or you can make it be a, you know, an abelian variety, right, if you pick a different Z. Yeah? And so there are many. So upshot, right? I just mean that upshot. Bar X can be watch. So no. <laughs> <laughs> EG. You know, KSR or, you know, Jacobian of, of a curve, K points. Or... Okay, but now here's the negative, the negative result, right? I said it. Uh, 
Um, but the theorem is that in this example, um, L as ruler X, So I claim that in this example, all right, many that every alpha has an infinite rank twisted back to bottom. Okay, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Okay. And I uh, I have 15 minutes to explain how this works. Um okay. So, um, so the idea is, so if alpha is the boundary of some polynomial L, this is the boundary map here, of the Picard group of C, right, to this H2A sum. Sorry. Yeah. Why is this a negative result? Oh, because I actually don't care whether this is equal to this. I care about whether X has the resolution property. Yes. So thanks for asking. And so because it's equal, however, I cannot conclude that X does not have the resolution property. Yeah, so this equality would have been implied by X having the resolution property. I don't know if that's true, but I do know the equality is true. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah. And actually, this is really fun. Okay. So these infinite rank vector bundles are really Fun and you, uh, okay. So what do you have to do, right? So write alpha as the boundary of an L. You have to find an alpha twisted only free um, module corresponds to um, an E uh, locally free. On the end, uh, and an isomorphism um, I have a star of E is isomorphic to J of the star E transfer L. Right? So, this is actually a really good way to understand. What this element in H2XGM is. It's coherent modules are sort of modules where you have like the two pullbacks are not the same, but they're the same after transferring by L. Okay. So all I have to do is I have to make an, an infinite rank vector bundle on Pn, which when I restrict it has this property. And what instead I'm going to do is I'm going to make an infinite rank vector bundle that no matter how you pull it back, it's always the same one. <laughs> so it's somehow, okay, let's see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. By the way, yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, and for, for this, I have to tell you about um, very positive infinite rank vector bubbles. Yeah, locally free modules, I mean. So, so, so would you say in this example, do you mean with the line of the conic or, or with uh, any? Any, any Z, yeah. Any Z and any two maps, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for asking. Yeah. And there's a more general theorem. You don't need to take Pn as the target. So you look, you can look in the paper. Yeah. <clears throat> but, um, so if let P be a projective scheme over K, and, and this should be infinite. Okay, but let's say algebraically closed. Um <clears throat> And then only one very uh, very ample, and then take some sections which which generate and then we're gonna let E be the co-limit 
um, of the following thing. You start with OP, then you do S. Ah, okay. And then S will be S1 to Fn from OP to OP1 plus yeah, so this is an in, this is an embedding of the structure sheet in this vector bundle, so that the co-kernel is loaded and free, right? Because I have no common zeros, and then you just do this of v one plus n, and then you do identity tensor s to o p one plus n tensor o p one plus n, and you go on, right? So identity tensor identity tensor s. Just keep having more and more tensor powers. Okay. And this is going to be my definition of a very positive infinite rank vector bundle on B, a projective scheme over the ground here. Okay, and it's a well and it's well defined. <laughs> this is already pretty bizarre. <laughs> okay. Ah. How should I do this? Yeah, I still have a little bit of time. So. Sorry, I will, I will undo this. Okay. Oh, that's a that's a fun. Yeah. So um, you have to prove this. <laughs> um, but um, if. The thing is, what like on an affine, if, um, after choosing a basis, the map will look like yeah, some right. So on an affine, there will be a section, and then you can just see that this co-limit is a direct sum of three pieces. Is it is a roughly speaking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So actually, interesting. So example on P one, this is not a direct sum of the variables. Right, it, it can be right because here you get all, all, all O of twos and here you get all O of threes. You can never map this to a coherent mod. Any map from this thing to a coherent module is zero. Yeah, except for well, a coherent module supported on points. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's really fun. Um, okay, so, so facts. Um, the isomorphism class of E is independent of tracers. It's just, it's a, it's a unique thing. It's a, yeah, okay. If G is finite, then G of the star of E is is the one for p prime. So if you pick a if you pick your very positive guy and you pull it back by a finite morphism, then it's very positive. <laughs> e tensor v is isomorphic to e for any finite rank. Well, also finite positive. They don't say oh, vector bundle v. So no matter what you tensor it with, if it's locally free or finite rank, 
then it just gives you the e back. <laughs> e -back. Uh, is this characterized by some universal property? Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we characterize it by saying it's a complement with, with some, some properties. And so you can, uh, it, in some sense, what it means is that take any coherent sheaf and you tensor with it, all higher cohomology disappears, and also it is sort of globally generated. But you have to say those things, I think, in a strong, sufficiently strong sense. So just like ample, ampleness. Also, you can, yeah. It's all, yeah. Uh, for example, direct sum of n copies of E is isomer to E, right? <laughs> and then um, push forward under a flat proper morphism of a very positive, subjective flat proper morphism of a very positive thing to very positive. Okay. So the first was, property, you need something. On, for the first property, you need something on O of one. It has to fulfill the assumption on P prime. G of G of a star. This e prime. This is the the very positive guy. Yeah, but with respect to on the P prime, but it, it's independent of choices. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So no matter means, what ample lineman you pick on P prime, of course, if you pick the pullback of the O of P with B, it's clear. Right? So, so what's O tends to O to E? I mean, what's E tends to E style trivial? It's also isomorphic to E. Yeah. I mean, what else could it be? <laughs> yeah. I mean, thank you for asking. <laughs> it's, a, it's a new theorem. Okay, I e tends to e dual. Oh no, you can't take duals. Oh, you can't take duals. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do you agree that this solves the the theorem now, right? I just take my very positive vector on Pn, I pull it back by i, I pull it back by j. They're very positive, so tensor L. There is an isomorph. <laughs> it's absurd, right? Um, there are some other amusing facts about this bundle. Um, for example, um, it generates a derived category of cross grid modules. Um, and um, I, I could sort of, yeah, like the Kiko of uh, P is E, but you have to do this big thing where you allow infinite direct sums. Okay. Um, and then, um, Another thing is that if, you, if f is finite locally free, let's call it v finite locally free, then there exists an exact sequence 0 to v to e to e to e. <laughs> Dimension p plus one terms. <laughs> so any finite locally free thing has a resolution in the wrong direction. <laughs> With this, it's hilarious to me. This is hilarious, and I wanted this to say, right? That the, I wanted this to say something about the Rupier dimension, right? I wanted it to say that, like, I only need this many cones, right? But I only get kind of locally free guys when I do this. Um, and then maybe a final thought is that, um, yeah. So this was negative. In my the way I think about it, it's a negative result. It's probably better to look for a kind example. It might be easier to look for those things where you take a take a project, you blow something down. You take a projective scheme, you take something that you can blow down to an algebraic space by, by Artin's criteria, and then you try to ask for the same question in that situation. And then I don't know the answer. Thank you very much. Questions. So you you have no notion which would be sort of dual to this one, which would always give you a final resolution. Mm -hmm. 
And those are notions which is sort of practice is one that. Is that a question? Yeah. Is there anything much one can say about um, why this column in? Is there anything much one can say about why you wanted to take this column in? Why is this the definition? No, it really started with. Um, okay, I wanted to prove this theorem, right? And so I was like, okay, I need to make something canonical on a projective scheme, right? Which has these properties. And then I just started thinking about an infinite rank thing. It's, it's going to be sort of a column like this. And then I was like, to make something unique, I should just make this a strictly increasing more and more and more ample thing. And the easiest way to say it to you in the, in the audience is to just write an explicit one, but that's not really necessary, right? I can characterize what kind of sequences will give you my variable. Yeah. Um, why is the, uh, why is countability in your definition necessary? Sorry, can you say it a little why bit louder? Is the, why is the accountability in your definition necessary? Oh, um, I don't think it's. Oh, it's just that it seems like you get it's a stronger result. The way I I believe it to be a stronger result if I everywhere say accountable and not just say arbitrarily large rank. And since for this argument with the Journalu device. I get a countable vector bundle when I do this trick. I decided to just say countable everywhere. What is the cohomology of E? Kind of uh, what kind? It's only eight zero, and it's gigantic. Oh, only a two. Yeah, it's like affine spaces. I, affine spaces. I so I don't know. Uh, maybe this this talk should have been one of those. You know, at at Ogofa, uh, they sometimes have a beer talk. <laughs> <laughs> and this this talk maybe should have been a beer talk where we can all be amused by this thing. <laughs> well, a beer talk is a very cultural concept, so you better don't use it here. <laughs> oh man! Yes. <laughs> it means that this talk yes. does not go online. <laughs> okay. Sorry. For like P one. Can you say something more about what he is, looks like? Or this? Well, you, you know, um, no, I mean, it's <laughs> you know, uh, it's like when you do on A2, right, with coordinates x and y, right, if uh, as you have in the ring, and then you have a, you know, x, y. Sorry, this is not helpful, right? But this is what it is, right? And then you do yeah. x, y, x, y, going to a four, right? And so, yeah. And and so somehow, like, what what is if you take this colon and you call it m, then for example, m is equal to x, y times m. And so it cannot be free, right? But on the printed spec, this is a free, this is a locally free thing, like I, I showed before. Yeah. I think you said that if you restrict to a finite type over a field, you don't have any counterexamples to the resolution property. Do you know any counterexamples if you say, I just want to ask for a scheme like finite or an algebraic space finite type over an Eulerian scheme? Or something like that? No, 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 no. As, lo as long as the diagonal is affine and the thing is quasi compact, I think we have no counterexamples. Um. Like, I'm saying, I'm not sure how you really compute like uh, um like those some infinite twisted uh, models. So, so like for example, let, let's just ask for P1. Yeah. Um like we know the problem is probably just a K self, but uh, then what's on the other? Yeah. On B1 the browser the H2 GM is zero. Okay. So it has to be true. It's just a one module. Okay. So that, 
Right, right. It will be, yeah. Okay, so let's ask something a bit more complicated, like photons cube. So for variety given by like cube, you form the rays and then you twist the y of the vertices to one, two, three. Would that be too complicated? No, I, I, I just want to push back a little, if that's okay. I think this is the kind of thing where maybe we should never try to compute an example. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but please think about Korean cheese and their cosmology. <laughs> sorry, sorry. All right, let's we stop here so, so that we have enough time for lunch. Yeah. <laughs>